Welcome to the Panorama panel discussion for the fall 2019 semester. My name is Jacqueline Granado and I will be serving as a moderator for today's discussion. This panel series is an opportunity for GSW community members to come together and share their perspectives on today's relevant topics. With help from the panelists, we hope that together we will all engage in intellectual reasoning through conversation. The topic for today's discussion is citizenship. The concept of citizenship, what it means, what rights and responsibilities it entails, who qualifies and how to become qualified has emerged as one of the burning political problems of our time. As we speak, for example, the US Supreme Court is deliberating on several cases that directly implicate the ability of non-citizens, including undocumented immigrants and foreign nationals, to both live in the United States and claim fundamental per protections guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. Collectively, our four panelists will try to begin to answer several questions about citizenship to help give contemporary issues context. These questions include, what are the origins of citizenship as a political concept? What does it mean to be a citizen? What fundamental rights in the United States are tied to citizenship and what rights are not? And what does citizenship look elsewhere in the world? Our four panelists will discuss these questions and yours. Ultimately, what will help move the discussion is to keep it lively is you and the questions you ask during the Q&A portion of the event. I would first like to begin to introducing the members of our panel. Then I will briefly explain the procedures of the panel discussion. Our panelists today are Dr. Michael Moyer. Michael Moyer is an assistant Associate Professor of English at Georgia Southwestern State University. His PhD is from the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC, and he specializes in 20th century British literature and Irish literature. Dr. John Lejeune. John Lejeune is an assistant professor of political science at GSW, where he teaches courses in political philosophy, modern political ideologies, and constitutional law. He received his PhD from the University of California, San Diego. Representative Mike Chokes. <laughs> Mr. Chokes is a member of the Georgia House of Representatives from the 138th District, which includes America's Georgia. Dr. Chose has more than a decade of experience as a state representative, and we thank him very much for taking time out of his busy schedule to engage in additional public service. Neha Bahautoki. <laughs> Neha is a GSW undergrad student. Neha is a citizen of Nepal and is studying at GSW as a foreign exchange student. Neha has generously offered to be to bring a comparative perspective to our panel by discussing some of the rules of citizenship in Nepal and comparing those to the United States. Each panelist has been asked to prepare a short opening presentation pertaining to the topic of citizenship. Once our panelists have made their presentations, we will transition to the question and answer portion of the event. During the Q&A forum, panelists will respond to questions from the audience. For the Q&A, we have mobile microphone attendants who would like to ask that everyone who has a question or comment raises their hand and one of our attendants will bring you a mic. In the interest of time, we would also like to ask that questions or comments from the audience be stated within one minute. Tonight's event is a Windows to the World sanction event. In order to earn the Windows to the World credit, please be sure to swipe in with one of our Windows to the World representatives at the back of the room. Without further ado, let's begin with our first panelist, Dr. Michael Moyer. Thank you, Jackie. All right. Hello. Uh, is there a clicker or something? Okay. Right. Here we go. Okay. So, um, because uh, I teach, uh, I teach English. I'm mostly interested in um, how the concept of the citizen develops, kind of in language. Um, and through the spread of print culture. So that's gonna be, gonna be kind of where my focus is. We are gonna be talking about the origins of the modern concept of the citizen, but I'm not gonna go as far back as, you know, say, ancient Greece, 
which I think some of the other panelists have said they're going to be working on. So I'm going to be sort of starting in what we think of as the Middle Ages, kind of broadly speaking, and working, our, working my way up kind of through the late 18th century here. So that is not the button I intended to press. All right. So <clears throat> the modern concept of sort of government is based around a lot of what we call the nation state, right? So a nation state is a political entity that is organized not just in terms of who controls what space, but in terms of some kind of shared set of cultural or ethnic values, right? The nation state is a relatively new historical phenomenon. Um, prior to this, um, people tended to be citizens of, say, like a large empire, right? And they didn't always feel a strong connection to, say, you know, the Austrian Empire, if they happen to live there, right? They might feel a strong connection to their local place, but they tended to feel connected largely to other sorts of things, right? So the way people typically, but I'm borrowing much of this from uh, the Irish political scientist Benedict Anderson's book, Imagined Communities. It's in the library, go read it. Um, <clears throat> so Anderson argues that most people felt connected to what they called the religious community sort of first and foremost, right? So this was based on a set of shared religious and cultural values um, rather than any sort of shared attachment to a particular um, large political space, right? So examples would be sort of like what we think of as like medieval Christendom, right? So, you know, the region of Europe that was controlled uh, largely by the Catholic Church. They're united by their, you know, sort of common practice of Catholicism. Uh, Islam um, in the Caliphate period. Um, the Chinese Middle Kingdom, right? And they're also often sort of connected to each other by this notion of a kind of, uh, by the notions of language as well, right? Often by a kind of sacred language. So like, for example, in medieval Europe, you had, you know, people in different regions speaking different lang vernacular languages at home, but this common culture connected by the use of Latin, right? A sort of common scholarly and religious culture. Now, in terms of political organization, um, we have what Anderson calls the dynastic realm. And so what we're talking about here is primarily uh, states that are ruled by a hereditary aristocrat or you know, a family, right, who um, basically kind of runs everything in the state, right? They're responsible for um, all government functions. And their authority often rests on some sort of sanction from the religious authority. How many of you have ever heard of the divine right of kings? Okay, a couple of, I, I hear, I see one hand up. That's, that's encouraging. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, the idea of the divine right of kings right, is that the king is divinely selected by God, right? And you know, it is his privilege then to rule so long as he maintains the sanction of the religious authority. So there's a connection between the religious community and states in the dynastic realm, but it's a pretty tenuous one, right? You know, um, he's dependent on some sort of approval from the religious community for his, in order to maintain his rule, but the king is not necessarily sharing the same cultural values as uh, his subjects. So inclusion is based solely on residence in this um, scheme, right? So if you live in, say, Austria in the year 1601, you are ruled by a Habsburg prince, you pay taxes to the Habsburg family, you grow turnips for the Habsburgs, and you are conscripted into Habsburg's armies. I say conscripted, right, because your average foot soldier was not a volunteer. Your average foot soldier was pressed into service because most people thought it were thought of not as citizens but as subjects, right? So to talk a little bit about what that means, what we mean by a subject, um, I'd like to sort of trace the origin of the word back to uh, its Latin root, right? So it comes from the Latin sub, under, and the suffix yachio, which means to throw. 
So literally, a subject is someone you throw under. Now this works its way into a noun, subjectus, which means simply an inferior, and comes into English uh, through the old French sujet, which means lying under, which in Middle English becomes subject, and in Modern English becomes subject, a person ruled over by another. So a subject does not have positive rights, right? A subject has duties. A subject has responsibilities to a state. The state does not grant the subject any, isn't required to grant the subject any particular rights. So in the late 18th century, the concept of the human being as subject in many countries, particularly in the West, is replaced by the concept of the citizen. And this also comes originally from Latin, right? We have the Latin civitas, which means city, which then in Old French becomes cité, which specifically refers to a cathedral city. Now this is important because there was a division between the way city dwellers were treated legally and the way rural people were treated under law, right? If you lived in a city, you were not under the authority of any particular lord or prince. City people had positive rights that rural people were not granted. So <clears throat> from Old French citoyen, city dweller, Anglo-Norman citizen, to Middle English citizen, to the modern concept of the citizen, right? A legally recognized resident of a nation state with associated rights and obligations, right? So you still have obligations to the state as a citizen, but the state also grants you particular rights, right? The citizen has a role in crafting the rules under which he or she is governed. The subject does not. And here we have, this is an image of uh, uh, sans culottes in the French Revolution. More on the French Revolution in a moment. So the idea of the citizen and the sort of transformation of the subject into the citizen uh, begins with uh, the idea of the public sphere, which is just coming into being in the 18th century. So I'm going to use the definition proposed by the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas. There he is. And as you try to read this, bear in mind that this is translated from German, right? So I'm just going to try to break this down for you a little bit, right? So the public sphere, according to Habermas, is essentially relatively educated middle class people getting together in public forums, whether these are physical places or, you know, through contact through letters, um, publications, things of that nature, um, that are distributed widely and push back against the hereditary authority of the state, right? So people taking charge of discourse, essentially, right? And what this kind of look, what this looked like in practice, you had in the 18th century uh, the rise of various public uh, associations um, and locations in which people gathered to discuss uh, politics and science and other such issues, right? So uh, there's a coffee house culture that arises in England in particular. Uh, learned societies develop. Um, wealthy people host salons in their homes uh, where artists and writers gather. Um, <clears throat> you also have the birth of a mass print media in this period, right? This is when we first see things like magazines and broadsheet newspapers coming into being. And by and large, these uh, associations of the public sphere kind of disregard social status, right? They are open, at least theoretically, to just about anyone. So while some of these um, particular organizations tended to be uh, very white, very middle class, very male, in particular the London coffee house culture, 
Um, there were other spaces, uh, the salons in particular tended to be dominated by wealthy women. And um, there were organizations called corresponding societies um, that often included uh, women and people of color as well. So, the American Revolution is itself fought, at least in its early stages, largely in the public sphere rather than on the battlefield. You have this push and pull between revolutionary publications, sometimes images and cartoons, uh, like Benjamin Franklin's Join or Die cartoon, which is uh, the segments of a snake rep uh, in 13 parts representing the 13 colonies. It's sort of cut into pieces, right? You have um, John Dickinson's letters from a, Pennsylvania, from a farmer from Pennsylvania. Paul Revere's uh, very uh, stirring visual image of the Boston Massacre. Thomas Paine's Common Sense. And the Declaration of Independence itself, right, which was first circulated widely in newspapers. Right, so it wasn't just a resolution the Continental Congress adopted, right? It was something that they sent out to be published in newspapers to try to get people behind it, right? Now, there was also a counter-revolutionary -revolu push, right? The loyalists had their own arguments that circulated in the public sphere. For example, uh, Samuel Seabury's 1774 uh, free Thoughts in the Proceedings of the Continental Congress, which argued that um, following the path outlined by the Congress would lead only to chaos and bloodshed. Charles Inglis's Deceiver Unmasked in 1776, and Thomas Hutchinson's Strictures Upon the Declaration of Independence. Uh, now, the fact that the Continental Congress put out a declaration at all indicates a changed view here of the role of the subject into a citizen, right? In English common law, a declaration was what the plaintiff in a lawsuit published at the beginning of that suit, right? So by, claim, by publishing this declaration, they are claiming the right to sue the government that ostensibly rules over them. But the declaration itself is, apart from the first two or three paragraphs, not so much an outlining of positive rights, those are more sort of implied, but more kind of a list of grievances against the king, right? Who uh, has apparently, as suggested in the declaration, sort of abused his subjects. Now, in the French Revolution, we get a similar document called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. And in the French context, citizen actually becomes an alternative to monsieur and madame, which have class implications. Monsieur and madame um, indicate the respect you're supposed to give to a social superior. Citizen eliminates that and kind of is um, meant to be an egalitarian sort of designation. Now, this is heavily influenced by social contract theory. Anybody know what social contract theory is? Anybody familiar? with the idea of social contract theory? Okay, a couple of you, good, all right. So for those of you who are not, right, social contract theory is the idea that the government and the people have to make some sort of compact in order for the government to function, for the government to govern, right? The people have to agree, essentially, to give up some rights and responsibilities to the government in order to have other rights and responsibilities protected. Um, so examples would be you know, John Locke, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, we prominent uh, social contract theorists. So it's in the French Revolution that citizen acquires this modern sense as an individual who acquires rights, not just responsibilities from the state, right? So I think I'm you know, running a little bit longer here than I want to. Um, I want to leave more time for other panelists. So any questions you have about this, uh, please do feel free to ask during the Q&A. Um, and if you're in one of my classes, come see me after the presentation um, and just, you know, check in. All right, thank you.
the button. All right. Testing. Okay. All right. All right. Um, all right. Thanks, Michael. Thanks to everyone for coming, uh, especially my students in the room. Even if you're here just for the credit, it's a great source of pride to see you here. So thank you for being here, really. And you don't know it, but I, I love you guys. And thanks also to everyone for their help and for their service. So thanks to Jacqueline, um, to the speakers, the Panorama Group, to Joe, to Judy, to John Fox, everybody who's here to help. It, like something like this, Anish, on the mic, it like it does actually take a village to do something like this. So thanks a lot. My presentation is called "Delineating Delineating Constitutional Rights: Citizen versus Non-Citizen," and it has three goals. First, to better understand the relationship uh, between citizenship and civil rights in the US. So broadly speaking, the question is, to what extent do our most valued liberties and rights actually depend on being a citizen? So imagine if your citizenship, imagine, like those of you in the room who are US citizens, imagine if your citizenship were stripped away. Like, would you be scared? Would, what would you be scared of? What rights do you think you would keep? What rights do you think you would lose? What actually depends on being a citizen? Um, for those who aspire to citizenship, as my wife did, like what rights do you get for being a citizen? Uh, secondly, and moving, I want to do this in kind of like concentric circles. They get closer and closer to the point. So secondly, moving closer, what can a close reading of the Constitution teach us in this regard? What are the patterns that we can observe, if any, just by reading the, reading the thing? So this is, this is also meant for my uh, political philosophy students and Civil War students. I keep telling you guys, read the text, read the text, cite the text, it's in the text. So this is going to be a lot of like citing the text, it's in the text, quoting, like, yeah, this is, what sh this is what's coming. So, all right, and third, um, moving us even closer, we need a specific example. So what about the specific example of voting, which is often the first thing that people reference when they think about citizenship rights? So let's begin with the question. Are voting rights tied to citizenship in the United States? And if so, how? And the answer is yes and no. It's a very complicated question, and it's a question that depends a great deal on context. And so provisionally, the first thing to note, so when we look at the text of the Constitution, there's two patterns that are interesting. And I'm like, like, if one is not an expert and one just reads the Constitution, you can see patterns here that are, that are interesting. The first is states and local governments make a lot of the rules when it comes to voting. So I think the political imagination tends to assume that it's the federal government that's making all of the voting regulations, when in fact a lot of what's happening is on, it's at the state and local level. A lot of that is left to the states in the Constitution to make those decisions. So state and local rules, though preempted at times by federal law, have a great impact on who can vote and when. And then second, at first glance, the Constitution does not expressly guarantee voting privilege to citizens in any qualified manner, at first glance. Later in the day, in the 14th Amendment and beyond, there does appear to be some link between citizen status and voting, but nothing clearly guarantees a you can vote right if you're a citizen. Um, but there's also not anything to necessarily exclude non-citizens from voting. Incidentally, a common sense way to understand the first point is to ask if citizenship by itself entailed voting rights, why weren't women immediately granted suffrage? Right? The very fact that the women's suffrage movement took so much work and took so long is indicative of this gap between citizenship rights and voting rights. One did not necessarily follow from the other. Before we get there, though, it is worth noting just by comparison that there are points in the Constitution that are, that are actually quite specific about citizenship requirements. So there are citizenship requirements for running for office at the federal level. And the Constitution is very explicit about that. So Article 1, Section 2, Clause 2. No person shall be a representative in the House of Representatives uh, who shall not have been seven years a citizen of the United States. Right? It's not ambiguous at all. Um, Article 1, Section 3, Clause 3. No person shall be a senator who shall not have been nine years a citizen of the United States. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5. No person except a natural-born citizen shall be, uh, dot, 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 uh, shall be eligible to the office of the president. 
So in terms of running for being eligible for office at the federal level, there are very specific requirements there. But note, like, there are all kinds of other possibilities not covered there. What about voting for federal offices? It says nothing about that here. What about running for a, fe what about running for a local office? What about voting for a local office? And so what the Constitution actually does when it comes to voting rights is the text leaves a lot of power to the states to make decisions about voting rights. So if you look at Article 1, Section 2, Clause 1, the House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year. In other words, you know, every two years we have these elections. And the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. So the Constitution is telling state governments we're not telling you exactly what voting rights have to be for federal offices. However, whatever the most numerous branch of your state legislature, whatever those, like whoever can vote for that, they can vote for the federal office too. Like the requirements have to match in some sense. Um, and then it's, I think a little more explicit in Article 1, Section 4, the times, places, and manners of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature. So it's giving a lot of authority to the states to determine what the voting rules, what the voting rights actually are in the states. So what that's actually going to mean is, and it's true until today, voting rights differ in many ways from state to state. Depending on what state you live in, there's all kinds of different voting rules. It's not a uniform policy throughout the country. Some things are uniform, but not everything is uniform. Um, but it does note this very important clause at the bottom. But the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations, except as to the places of choosing senators. So if Congress, the federal government, at some point decides to make voting laws, they can preempt what the states are doing. Congress has the authority to make voting laws. All right. Here? There? OK. Um, I hit it twice. All right. So what that actually means is a couple things. If state governments historically want to give voting rights to some citizens and not others, and want to give voting rights to non-citizens, states, states can do that. And states have done that. So check out this map. And by the way, I always talk about citing your sources. So credit to where credit is due. So these two papers, Kimia Podkaman and uh, Virginia Harper Ho, I, I knew virtually nothing about this topic about 48 hours ago. And so I, I'm leaning heavily on these papers. So like credit where credit is due. And this shows you, by the way, it, you know, in parentheses, why, why do we write academic papers? It's for other desperate professors who have to give talks and who need to learn this stuff like really quickly. So thanks to these authors. So I took, uh, I took this map, in fact, from the, the map source cited here. And what you see in the yellow is at different time periods, these are states that actually gave voting rights to non-citizens. So the state legislatures or local governments said like, we're, we're, we are making a conscious decision that non-citizens will have the right to vote in certain elections. So what's going on? I talked to some historians in my department. So between 1800 and 1849, um, it was explained to me that that was like a, a Republican period. So there was an ideology in the era about like self-rule and self-government and power to the people. So we're going to give power to everybody. And so a lot of states were giving non-citizens the right to vote. In between 1850 and 1899, a lot of that is about westward migration. So it's like you're trying, to get, you're trying to get people to move out west so you can have more population. And so one thing that you offer is like all these political rights. So come out, whether you're a citizen, whether you're not a citizen, like you're going to have voting rights out here. Come move out west. Um, but then you can see it's sort of like there's an upward trend and then there's a downward trend. And so in the 1920s, this all starts to go away, more or less. And, but I want to read you just a, a couple passages here, again, citing my source, so this, the, the Virginia Harper Ho source, what is actually going on in terms of how states are making decisions about who to give voting rights to? So um, just, to, just to give you a sense of like how, how prevalent non-citizen voting rights were and the criteria for voting, here you go. Um, aliens voted under the early constitutions of Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Rhode Island, Vermont and Virginia, all of which granted the right to vote using the more general freeman terminology. 
It also has been established that unnaturalized immigrants voted and held local office throughout, such, throughout the colonies, including in Maryland as early as 1692, South Carolina in 1704, Pennsylvania as of 1747, and the Northwest Territory under the Ordinance of 1787. States and territories originally part of the Northwest Territory also continued to allow alien suffrage, although the territories only elected officials within their jurisdiction and non-voting delegates to Congress. They did not elect federal legislators or executive officers. Through the colonial and early federal period, Alien suffrage was often uncontested because voting rights were not based on citizenship, but on property ownership and race, as well as residence. At the time the US Constitution was ratified in 1788, almost every state required some form of property ownership to qualify for the vote. With the development of a more market-oriented society, a potential voter's stake in society, as indicated by tax-paying, military service, and general civic contributions, became the new basis of the right to vote. While this rationale further substantiated denial of the vote to women who generally were not involved in activities which would demonstrate a stake in society, the stake-based conception left uncontested the right of white male immigrants to vote. Up to the War of 1812, the states commonly extended voting rights to white male immigrants as property ownership, race and gender, not citizenship, defined the voting population. So what starts to happen in, uh, in the 1920s, according to the authors, uh, first is a response to World War II. That there was, uh, you might say, a bit of a xenophobic reaction uh, following, I'm sorry, World War I, not World War II, World War I. Uh, xenophobic reaction after World War I. And also, uh, the, the, the demographics of immigration in the United States changed. So the authors argue that um, prior to 1920, it was uh, more Anglo-Protestant immigration into the United States, and then it started to change to different areas like South, uh, like Slavic countries, South, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, the Mediterranean, and so there were different, let's say, cult cultural and ethnic factors at stake as well. Um, but it's in the 1920s that this really starts to change. So, but let's then talk about, like, okay, so is there nothing in the Constitution that really links citizenship to voting? Like, really, nothing? Well, starting with the 14th Amendment, we start to see a pattern here. So the 14th Amendment you have, 1868, right after the Civil War, um, when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for a bunch of federal offices is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States or in any way abridged except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in such state. So the language here, it's, very, it's verbose. But look what it's doing. It's not guaranteeing male suffrage. It's not guaranteeing suffrage if you're 21 years old. It's saying if you don't give, if a state does not give suffrage to someone who's male and 21, they're gonna they're gonna be penalized for it. But it's not mandating it. If we look at other developments in the Constitution, so 15th, 19th, 24th, 26th Amendment, you can start to see patterns in the language that's being used. So we will often describe, some, let's say, the 19th Amendment as women were granted the suffrage with the, with, 19th, with the 19th Amendment. But the language is kind of strange in that regard. So like, let's look at the 19th Amendment. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So the language is not saying women, all women can vote. It's saying the right to vote cannot be denied on account of sex. And so the language, the 15th Amendment is the same. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged on, the, on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The right of citizens, 24th Amendment in 64, uh, to vote, it's the exact same language, um, shall, not be, shall not be denied or abridged for failure to pay any poll tax or other tax. 1971, the 26th Amendment. The right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older shall not be denied or abridged on account of age. So it's, the Constitution starts to define these reasons. It's not giving like, like if P then Q. Like if you have this characteristic, you can vote. If you are a citizen, you can vote. It's saying if you are a citizen, 
uh, you cannot be denied the right to vote based on A, B, C, D, or E. Does that make sense? There's a little bit of a difference there in the language. But it does, so what does it actually mean in practice? There, there is something going on here between citizenship and the right to vote. It's a bit kind of fuzzy, it's a bit fuzzy, at least to me, exactly what's going on with that relationship, but citizens are getting some kind of different protection than non-citizens, right? This is, these, clause, these amendments are covering citizens, but they're not covering non-citizens. It seems de deliberately written that way. And also what it does, it does not prevent states, by the way, for abridging the right to vote for other reasons, right? So the right to vote could be denied, let's say, on the basis of residency. It can be denied, that you, we've, we've, we're probably all familiar with the controversies over voter ID laws, um, felony convictions. There are even cases on the books where like landowning status is still relevant in terms of having the right to vote in certain areas. Um, in certain areas, like for primary elections, you can or cannot vote based on whether you register with one party or the other, and that will vary from state to state. So the right to vote, if one is a citizen, can still be like hindered or restricted, just not based on these particular characteristics, if one is a citizen of the United States. So there is some relationship here. Now, where does Congress come in? And where does the federal law, and this is coming to a conclusion here, in 1996, Congress did pass a law which said, it shall be unlawful for any alien to vote in any election held solely or in part for the purpose of electing a candidate for the office of president, vice president, presidential elector, member of the Senate, member of the House, delegate from the District of Columbia, or in other words, federal elections, right? So they're restricting the ability of non-citizens to vote in federal elections. However, if you continue to read the language, that's it. So states, it's still up to states to determine whether or not non -cit first of all, the terms under which citizens can vote in federal elections, as long as it's consistent with the other amendments in the Constitution, um, and also the terms under which non-citizens might be able to vote. And so today, we, we have, there aren't many examples in the United States, but there are a few today where non-citizens do have the right to vote. So currently, and these are in the, the articles that I read, these are the only instances that are cited in the country. Um, currently, no state has a statewide non-citizen voting right. However, at the more local level, uh, the city of Chicago allows non-citizen legal residents, including green card and visa holders, to vote in local school council elections. Maryland has 10 towns that allow non-citizens to vote in local elections. And, perhaps, and most recently, and perhaps most controversially, San Francisco currently allows all citizens, irrespective of legal status, to vote in local school board elections. So if you've been reading the news in recent years, that's been in the, in the news. Um, so, it's, so does citizenship, does voting depend on citizenship? Yes and no. Kind of does and it kind of doesn't. It's a, really, it's a really interesting story and one I hope I promised you, if you read the text, you can learn something. And so we read a lot of text, and uh, I hope you learned something. Thank you. Well, this is great. My name is Mike Chokas. I serve as the state representative in Atlanta for the state of Georgia for District 138. And my district is uh, most of Sumter County, all of Sly, all of Marion, and all of Chattahoochee County. I have the good fortune of, uh, of my district stretching from the Flint River to the Chattahoochee River, and it includes Fort Benning. Um, this has been a very interesting talk thus far, and I'm really enjoying it and learning a little bit as, as well, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I have a unique... Uh, perspective on citizenship. As many of you know, uh, I'm of Greek descent. My grandfather uh, came to this country uh, at the age of 17 on Thanksgiving Day in 1904. So uh, Thanksgiving has always been a special holiday for, for my family. Um, 
He was a naturalized American, uh, took the citizenship test, had sponsors uh, in Americas, and, uh, and, and became and wanted to be a citizen. Um, I am what is known as a citizen legislator, which means that I am a part-time legislator. I still have an occupation. I still have my own personal uh, uh, business or employment. Uh, and that's different from other states in the federal government that have full-time legislators. And they are actually paid out of your tax dollars. And so they're there full-time uh, to govern us in the way that we want them to through the elections. And we were talking about voting earlier. Um, I want to say something that all of y'all probably already know, but the United States is unique. It was an experiment, and it rebelled against England with the Bill of Rights. And we were considered subjects um, of the British Crown. And um, we've all heard of the Boston Tea Party. Taxation would not without representation. We wanted to be part of the British Parliament, and the British Parliament did not want us to be. They looked at us as subjects that was so eloquently defined. Um, and um, that's what got the ball rolling. In the early days of the War of Independence, um, it was about a 50-50 split between loyalists and, and uh the people that wanted their independence, and it moved and it swayed as the battles for fault. As a matter of fact, most of New York, uh, not New York State, but New York City was loyalist at the time. Um, but with that, and with the Declaration of Independence, and with our Constitution, the power is the people. The citizens of this country, you and I, are the ones that give the power to our local governments to administer things for the benefit of all. And then we in turn give power to the state level, which is me, to administer things at a state level for the people. And then in turn, we also do it at the federal level. Now, looking at it from the ancient Greek and if you read some of the, the works of ancient, ancient Greeks, the citizenship was a designation. It wasn't just one of a group of people. You were designated a citizen by land ownership, by responsibility, by service in the military, but you had responsibilities. So the point that I would like for y'all to get from me tonight is that citizenship also you have your rights, but in the other hand, you have your responsibilities, one of which obviously is jury duty. Uh, in other countries, it's mandatory to vote. In this country, it's, uh, it's optional. I had the opportunity to live in Europe for over four years, so I saw quite a few different methods of government. As a matter of fact, when I was living in Greece, it was under a dictatorship. So you really begin to appreciate what rights you have as a dictatorship, when, 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 and as, as a citizen of a free country, when you have those rights removed and you have no recourse, not whatsoever. I've been to Nepal, to Kathmandu, and you have a beautiful country and a beautiful people, and uh, they were recovering from a, a civil war uh, that lasted 20 years, if, am I correct? And they were in the process of writing their constitution. I was sent by the um, State Department on a nation building project. Uh, and um, it's been, it was an interesting experience, it really was. I got to travel the country, go to the Himalayas, it was, it was really interesting. But people want to be citizens, people, desire that. We had that in ancient Greece and Athens. We also had that in, in, in Sparta. And, and, and that's what they expected. They expected the citizen to defend the rights of the people, the government, 
and I use the term government kind of loosely, to, dis to protect the community of individuals that live in that location and identify themselves with that group. Because in ancient Greece, it was city-states. You had Sparta, and you had Athens, and you had all these other areas. Um, but again, there was a responsibility. We were talking earlier about the rights and privileges of citizenship. And in this country, one of the things that, that we haven't talked so far about was birthright. The United States is the only country in the world, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you can do the research, but it's the only country in the world where if you were born here, you have a right to be a citizen, regardless of where your parents were born. My grandfather immigrated from here. My grandmother immigrated from here. My father was born in America, Georgia, and he was automatically a citizen, even though at the age of six, he went back to Greece to go to school. Subsequently, I was born here. I'm an American citizen as well. Now, on an interesting note that we were talking about the United States, but let's look at it globally. My daughter, my youngest daughter, many of y'all know Lexi Chokas, um, she wanted to live overseas. And she did several study abroad, abroad programs while in college, and she asked me to check into a dual nationality. And with my great background and heritage, you know, we hired an attorney to see what we could do. Well, there are restrictions. There are residency restrictions. There's responsibilities that they require property ownership in many cases, uh, the ability to have a job. In most countries, if you want to immigrate and become a citizen, they see it as taking away from an opportunity of their current citizens, so they put in place barriers or levels. So if you have an expertise in a particular field that they need, then entry to that country as a citizen is less restrictive as if you don't. So when we talk about, and believe me, I tried, <laughs> and I was unsuccessful. I don't mind telling you, I was uns unsuccessful um, in, in getting her that dual, dual nationality. And it's the same true with, you know, we have a current group coming in from South America, Latin America. Try to become a citizen of those countries. There are requirements and there are responsibilities and there, you, know, you just can't go there and say, hey, I'm here, I bought a house, I'm a citizen, they're not going to do that. It's not, it's not allowed. Uh, and so I want us to, to look at this on a global level and see how this affects us. Um, the way I kind of look at it and it may be oversimplistic, is the citizens of, of, of this community or this state or our nation are, are kind of like a family. And, you know, we have our parents and we live under one roof and, you know, we kind of take care of each other. And um, that's great, you know. You're gonna, you know, many of you have, have brothers and sisters and you're gonna come to their defense you're going to give them some money if they need it. You're going to let them stay with you. You're going to feed them, clothe them, house them. Okay, but what if, I don't know, a friend of yours from down the street or, or someone from another city came to your home? Would your parents treat them the same way? They just showed up at your doorstep and said, hey, I'm here. Are they going to be invited in the house? Are they going to get an allowance? Are they going to be fed, educated, and clothed? And, and that's, you know, to a certain degree, we need to look at it, in my opinion, that's totally my opinion, from that type of context. We, we need to look at what the world is doing as far as citizenship. We need to look at uh, what we can do as far as citizenship. And then we also have to understand that as citizens of this country, these rights these res uh, that we have, we also have responsibilities that we share. 
And when we're talking about voting, one of the most interesting things that's going to happen with voting, and especially this election cycle, is the census. We redraw our lines every 10 years, and it's up to the state legislature to do that. And when we draw the lines, we draw the lines for local governments, we draw the lines for state governments, and we draw the lines for our uh, uh, men and women of Congress. Not the senators, obviously, but our congressmen. And we have the technology now where we use voter registration and so forth um, to have it down to a very small variance. In my district, 138, and throughout the state of Georgia, and I can't speak for other states, but I can speak for this district because I've gone through, we have a variance of 100. So my district, which is a little less than 60,000 uh, population, my district can vary from the neighboring district by no more than 100. Now, I don't know if anyone in here would know this. Um, does anyone know what the variance is for Congress? Do you know what the variance is for Congress? One. One vote. That's the variance. So we're going to spend some time drawing these maps. And we do it at the state level. And it's a way of keeping the federal government in track. Our system of government is unique because of the checks and balances that we have. We got the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And uh, to my knowledge, I don't think any other country in the world had that at that time, and they tried to, uh, to, to copy it to a certain degree, but have been unsuccessful at it because our founding fathers were so good at creating that balance. So, you know, Congress sends out these federal laws, but then we, in turn, have the ability to construct their district. So there's a lot of give and take, a lot of talk, a lot of communication, and um, many times our congressmen who are up in Washington are, are, uh, have been members of the local legislature. Many times they go from school board, county commissioner, or state legislator to Congress. Um, we were talking about some of the responsibilities, and I'm going to get off on something uh, um, that I know a little bit more specifically. And this may not be exactly on target as far as citizenship, but it is something that, that I do and, and, and I enjoy doing is when I go to Atlanta and work on legislation. And the state of Georgia has a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. And um, we have to, we've got 40 legislative days to do it, and we cannot adjourn unless we do it. And um, this is an old budget. I brought one with me that I had. And it's how about 21 or $22 billion of your money is spent in the state of Georgia. And it's a very interesting process because we're negotiating with the governor. We're negotiating with the Senate and we're given um, budget requests by the agencies. Board of Regents gives us a request every year, and that's approximately 10% of the budget. Our K-12 education system, which many of y'all went through in public education, um, that amounts to about 45% of the state budget. So the state invests 55% of their budget in education. And that is, does not include the HOPE Scholarship. The HOPE Scholarship is on top of that. Um, and that's about a billion dollars a year as well. And I could go into detail about that, but y'all probably know more about the HOPE Scholarship than I do. So I'll, I'll leave that alone. Um, when we pass legislation, 
And I'll talk about one piece of legislation that was um, probably one that I felt had the biggest impact, not, not only in this state, but by being shared in other states. And that is the uh, Access to Cancer Treatment Act. And I named it after President Carter. It's the Jimmy Carter Access to Cancer Treatment Act. Now, let me tell you what the issue was. If y'all remember a few years ago, President Carter had cancer and was given some experimental drugs. It was the latest, greatest at the time. And within six months, he was cured. There was zero cancer. He came out and made the announcement. The problem is most health insurance policies don't cover that. The health insurance policies require a protocol if you're at stage four metastatic cancer, which means it's the final stage of cancer and it's spreading, you have to take this drug first, and if that doesn't work, you take this drug, and if that doesn't work, you take this drug. And by that time, you're dead, if it, none of those are working. And the legislation that, that I sponsored and I passed allowed your local physician to prescribe an FDA-approved drug, any FDA-approved drug, that he or she thinks will be beneficial in the treatment of your cancer, uh, and the insurance companies are required to pay it. And um, we got that passed. I got it passed in the House, went over to the Senate, and that's how the procedure goes. I, I'll go a little bit about that. Goes over to the Senate. I had to get a sponsor in the Senate. We got it passed in the Senate. And I went to the governor and uh, got his blessings, and he signed it, and it became law. Um, some of the things, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that um, we had uh, this year. Is, um, uh, one of the ones that uh, we dealt with public safety, that was an interesting bill. Uh, dealing with, uh, especially with the security in our K-12 schools. We had, uh, we spent money on mental health. Uh, we protected historical monuments. Uh, we, uh, I don't know if y'all are familiar with CON. CON is Certificate of Need, and that's how we regulate our hospitals. We had a, a lively debate on that. Um, because we wanted full disclosure for some of our hospitals. One of the things that we hear is that our hospitals are closing because of lack of funding. Um, to a certain degree, that's true, but then why are other hospitals thriving and making lots and lots of money and uh, maybe not sharing? Um, we had the heartbeat bill. That was interesting. We had a lot of people from across the country come and demonstrate at the Capitol. I was amazed at the interest in, in, in what we had uh, going on up there. And then we dealt with other more mundane issues like funding for different programs. I concentrated mostly on funding issues. I'm on the Appropriations Higher Education uh, Committee. As a matter of fact, about eight or nine years ago, I got the funding for this building and the other building put in the budget. And I was very, very proud of that. Um, we put the money in the budget. And when I say I worked with my, my committee on this, but um, I had the most input is on the Flory Chapel uh, Gymnasium. We put about three and a half million dollars in the budget for that. So you're gonna see shortly uh, renovations there. We put money in the budget for South Georgia Technical College. They had a um, site improvement that they needed to do and that's being done as we speak. I also had the good fortune of putting a little bit of money for uh, Marion County for their middle high school. They needed some um, uh, um, ag ed, an ag ed facility, and I was able to get a little bit of money in that. Um, I'm going to end with um, something that my dad told me. And I had finished college, and as I said, I lived overseas quite a few years, and I came home. And um, I went to see my father, and um, the JCs is. Uh, 
uh, it's called it's the Junior Chamber of Commerce, and they get involved in the local community and help in different things. Um, it's partly networking, but partly getting involved in the community and um, participating in things. We were young. We started in our mid-20s. We put up Christmas tree lights and did things like that. Um, had a haunted house for the children. We did a lot of community things. But anyway, my father was a JC and I came home, went to see him. I hadn't been in America so week. And my father said to me, he said, the JCs meet on Thursdays. Are you going this Thursday or next Thursday? And I said, Dad, I'm going this Thursday. He said, you made the right choice. So with that, get involved. Our state, our nation, our community needs you to be active. And if you value your citizenship, you will also value your duty and responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Chokus. Hello, everyone. I am Neha Buratoki, and I'm a student here at GSW, and I'm from Nepal. So Dr. Kussler and Dr. Lejeune thought that I would have a different perspective on today's topic, and I would like to thank them and thank Panorama for providing me this opportunity, and I would like to move forward with the presentation. Oh, yeah. Don't even worry about my last name. That's okay. So, moving on with the topic, um, when I personally think about citizenship, this is the diagram I want y'all to focus on. And when I think about citizenship, I really like wonder if it ensures equality, justice, and diversity. Well, diversity, of course, yes. But the more research I did for today's presentation, the more I began to question the very statement that a citizenship ensures equality, justice, and diversity. I'll be talking more about this uh, in the later slides, however. For now, I would like to talk more about um, similarities and mostly differences between the citizenship in Nepal versus the citizenship in America. Um, I know most of y'all probably don't even know where Nepal is. Somebody told me, isn't it a part of India? No, it's not. Nepal is its own country, and it's between India and China, and it's in Asia. And people from Nepal are called either Nepalese or Nepali. It's not Napoleon. I say this because I'm going to use the word Nepali a lot in the further presentation, and I don't want y'all to get confused. Okay, so let's briefly talk about the two types of pres um, citizenships. So the first, so first kind of citizenship is citizenship by birth. Okay, uh, so this is the kind of citizenship um, Dr. Chokus gave talks briefly about, and it prevails in the United States. He said it's only in America, however, it's also in United UK and also Australia. So this is a type of citizenship where if a person is, becomes a citizen of the state where he or she is born, regardless of the parent's citizenship. So if you're just born in the country, you're good. You have the citizenship. And the second kind of citizenship is citizenship by blood. Now that's the kind of citizenship we're going to talk about in context of Nepal. Now, um, just like the name itself like insists, like tells, um, citizenship by blood mainly depends on a bloodline, so you would have to have either one of your parents to be a citizen of that country in order, to, in order for the child to get the citizenship of the country. And this prevails mostly um, in the South Asian countries. A lot of them have it, and it also is in Nepal. And so you would have to be like Nepali Nepali to be a citizen. You can't just like simply go like be born in that country in order to be, be a citizen. Now we're gonna talk about who 
as a Nepali citizen. Okay. So firstly, um, the first point is naturalized citizens, okay? So a person, in order to become a citizen, we would have to spend about 10 years in Nepal and then apply for the process. However, in Nepal, it's very rare for a person to get um, citizenship through naturalization. Now, um, let's focus on the two red bullet points that are there, because we're gonna talk about them more briefly in the further slides. And according to the Constitution, it says that either one of the parents, if either one of the parents is Nepali, the child would be granted the citizenship. And in the second point, it says that, yes, if the parents are unknown of the child, they will be granted citizenship. However, after age 16, they'll be processed for naturalization and they would have to go from that process. And Here's a fun fact for all of y'all. The Constitution of Nepal was established in 2015. That is just like four and almost five years ago, which is crazy because, and Dr. Um, Lejeune talked about different Supreme Court cases where um, people fought to like finesse the uh, rights of people and however, in the case of Nepal, we're struggling very much as to what is written in the constitution and what is applied in reality. So there's a lot of controversy going on. And the two points, um, I'm gonna elaborate more on that in the further slides. However, for now, we're gonna talk about um, why, why does one need a citizenship? So firstly, just like Dr. Lejeune um, said, voting rights are associated with citizenship. And the next four points, I feel like they're a little different from Nepal uh, versus America, as in Nepal, citizenship is required for a simple task such as getting a job, opening a bank account, uh, making a transaction, and um, even proceeding like higher education after grade 10. And as simple as getting a driver's license, you require a citizenship. So the question arises, okay, so if everything requires citizenship, so like all the people should have it, right? And this is a tough question because the answer is no. Four million people in Nepal do not have citizenships. They are stateless. And um, so you all must be thinking, so they must either be like immigrants or something like that. That is also untrue because only one to 2% of Nepal's total population are immigrants and the four million people that are stateless are just Nepali Nepali people, but they don't have citizenships, so they're just chilling, okay? So there's a lot of, factor, a lot of factors that comes into account when what contributes to that big of a number. And compared to America, which is only about 7%, 14% for such a small country is in fact a huge number. Okay, so. Um, Now moving on to um, what are the factors that come into account while um, that contribute to the four million people that are stateless. Um, remember the meme that said how Nepali parents would ask you not to talk to a stranger before to marry one? Yes, arranged marriage is still a thing in Nepal. And um, when I think about arranged marriage, the thing that pops up to my head is patriarchy. So our society is very patriarchal. And then that is why like a single mother cannot pass down her citizenship to the child if the dad just does not decide to show up one day. So having a child out of wedlock is still a wild concept in Nepal. And our society is very narrow and we're yet to progress in that sense. And, um, and Despite being mentioned in the constitution, like either one of the parents, if they're Nepali, the child will be Nepali, that does not apply in reality. No, a single mother 
like there are a lot of single mothers who are still struggling and their children are stateless just because our society decided that they cannot be given citizenship because someone had a child out of what. Okay, now I would like to so show you a video that could clarify more on this topic. Okay. No, my bad. What is the mouse? I can't see the mouse. Okay. Okay, I see it. Oh. Oh. Okay. 20-year-old Shivani Karel has found that navigating the rules made by politicians is not easy. She was born in Nepal to Nepalese parents, but she's stateless. That's because she cannot prove that her father is Nepalese after he abandoned her mother when Shivani was just five. Government officials do not allow Nepali mothers to pass citizenship to their children, even though the interim constitution says that it is possible. There are no provisions without father. They directly told us that. Taking birth in Nepal only doesn't give you citizenship. Then my mother cried in front of the CDO that uh, my um, children's future is damaged totally. They told that, they told on her face that you should have thought that before sleeping with that man. Shivani's parents never registered the marriage. All that her mother knows is the name of the district he was from. Even the name she was told could be a lie. Without a citizenship card, Shivani cannot get a job to help her mother. A citizenship certificate is required for everything, from getting a driving license to getting a passport. There are more than 4 million people in Nepal who don't have citizenship papers. So far, at least constitutionally if not in practice, mother or father can give citizenship to their children. But the new constitution being drafted says that both parents have to be Nepalese citizens. Sapna Pradhan Malla, a lawyer and a former member of the Constituent Assembly, has been advocating for citizenship through mothers for over a decade. The problem is also in the, in the mindset. Uh, mindset is patriarchy. So even where the law allows in certain conditions to get a citizenship, uh, they are resistant because how can we give uh, citizenship through daughter? Constitutionally, there is a way out. Citizenship through naturalization. But the district administration office in Kathmandu has never granted this type of citizenship. To the, till the date, uh, we do not uh, have any provision to issue a certificate to a boy or girl whose father has not been identified as a Nepali. After 16, he needs to prove that his father is or was a Nepali citizen. If he, he or she cannot prove that, we consider is her, her father as a non-Nepali, and we do accordingly. Despite constitutional provisions, officials have made it impossible for children to inherit citizenship through their mothers. The fear is, with the new law, more people are going to find themselves stateless. So How do I go to the next slide? So um, by now you can conclude that how patriarchal is the Nepali society and we're talking about 25 and forward here and still our society is very behind when it comes to that aspect and Nepali single mothers who cannot even pass down their citizenship to their child because the father of the child just does not decide to show up one day. So when women's rights are such a big deal throughout the globe Single mothers in some part of the world are struggling to even pass down their citizenship to their own child. Okay, so I feel like I'm running out of time, so 
Another factor that contributes to um, the four million people, stateless people in Nepal, is also the um, children whose parents are unknown. So the constitution says that um, they'll be considered citizens until age 16. However, after that, they will be ha they'll have to like go through the process of naturalization. And just like in the video you just heard, like nobody's ever gotten a citizenship through naturalization. So there's like a big gap between what's written in the Constitution and what is applied in reality. Um, I hope this changes very soon and there are a lot of like activist groups and people who are actually um, working on this and I hope that changes very soon. So I would like to conclude my presentation by saying that when I first started my presentation I said citizenship ensures equality, justice and diversity. However, at the, I would like to conclude my presentation by saying that citizenship in Nepal does it actually ensure equality, justice, or even diversity? That's a big question mark. Um, thank you. And putting the politics aside and all the controversies aside, we have Visit Nepal 2020 going on in Nepal, which is a year dedicated to tourism and tourists, as it is a major part of our econo uh, economy. So I would suggest you to visit Nepal. It's very nice. Yeah. Thank you. We will now move on to the Q&A portion of the event. If you have a question for one of our panelists, please raise your hand and one of our attendants will bring you a mic. To get things started, I would like to pose a question to all of the panelists. Of all the factors that make citizenship a contested concept, what do you think is the most important or perhaps the most interesting? Could you repeat the last part of that? Um, I'll just repeat the question. Of all the factors that make citizenship a contested concept, which do you think is the most important or perhaps the most interesting? I think I said that is because you're, you, being a citizen, you have the rights and the responsibility, and it's a balance. Uh, and that's why in other countries like in, oh, I'm sorry. And that's why in other countries like Nepal, you have to apply for the citizenship. Um, and, and uh, in other countries, as you can see, you can't get a driver's license, can't open a bank account, can't get a job. You know, in this country, you know, you don't have to be a citizen to open up a bank account or get a driver's license. Um, and so I, I guess it's, you know, w we enjoy these rights and privileges but we also have a, a, a shared responsibility. Not if you don't want to. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I guess like I'm like most interested in the distinction between, you know, what makes someone a citizen and what makes someone a subject. I think the most interesting thing is that d that divide really does in a lot of places persist. I mean, like as Niha pointed out, I mean, there are pe four million people in you know, a country that ratified its constitution four years ago, who are still living um, as subjects, as you know, as, state, you know, as essentially subject to state authority, but with none of the rights and responsibilities that come with citizenship. So what's interesting to me is the sometimes narrow ways in which um, states decide who gets to be a citizen, right? Who, how those rights and responsibilities get parceled out. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask?
Usually what happens is they go for the process of naturalization and it's like it depends on it is a long process because you know how government work is, right? And especially in like developing countries, it takes about a month or two to even process one letter from one office to the other. So it takes a long time. However, if you do apply for that process, there is like, it's gonna happen eventually. However, it takes a very long time. And at that time, you will be provided with, um, I don't know what it's called in English, but it'll be like a, wow, I can't speak English, okay. Um, temporary, there you go, yes. Um, not that, it's just like, a, like you will be given an identity uh, based on either one of your parents, like, uh, which is like a temporary ID for yourself. So you can use that to go into schools and stuff like that. However, like everybody has to like apply very early as it takes a very long time to actually happen. Thank you. Hello, um, this is just a question for all the um, panelists. Um, do you think that citizenship is more of a, um, is there more of a cultural reason for citizenship or like I'm speaking on why citizenship is so diverse, so how it's different here than it is everywhere else. It's not like, it's not the same in other countries than it is here. Is it more of a cultural reason or is it more economically driven and just because of their government I'll, I'll I'll pick this up like like I'm just gonna say like it it depends um, and this has always been the case like for example you know I'm talking about uh, you know the French Revolution bringing in that kind of modern idea of what citizenship like is this is there like echo or something on this this, this feels very strange <laughs> but um, you know um, we'll just we'll just go with it. <laughs> Nothing now. Um, so um, even in that, like, <laughs> even in that attempt to like sort of make citizen a kind of egalitarian designation, right? It didn't apply to everybody. It did not, for example, apply um, to biracial or black people in Haiti, for example, which was then a French dominion. So like people who were in the French dominions did not get to be citizens. They were still uh, subjects. So there were, you know, cultural and racial reasons for that. In some cases, the reasons may be economic, right? But it, it, yeah, it, it seems that, you know, states define citizenship based on a variety of criteria, and it's it's hard to pin it down any single pattern. It's more, if you want to really look at citizenship and you want to look at the state, it starts with the people. The people in, develop the state and then they provide the rules to protect the people. So it's not the state first, it's the people's first. It's the people's from, from France and it's the people's that lived in the area of Greece or the people that lived in other areas of the world, Nepal. Um, to give you an example is we had our 13 original colonies. We were all subject of King George, if I'm not mistaken. And the 13 original colonies formed their own legislator, legislatures to protect the individuals in those colonies. And the state of Georgia had a general assembly. Uh, Maryland had a house of delegates. And so these formed as a political unit after the fact that the people were here. And then we were 
separate. Georgia and New York were common in maybe language and a little bit of heritage, but that was about it, and we were all subject to England. But our 13 colonies united to form what is now the United States of America. So I think the, the basic formula would be it, it came from the people to form a community for the protection of everyone as a whole. And, and I'm gonna give a little caveat here on, you mentioned the French Revolution. And um, Greece, I'm gonna talk a little bit about history. And the, Greece was conquered by the Turks or the Ottomans in 1453, and Greece ceased to be a, a state, ceased to be a country in 1453. And oh, for almost 400 years, we were, we were subjects, non-citizens of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the language was banned. They had underground schools. Our religion was banned. We're Orthodox Christians. And the Muslims frowned upon that. They turned our churches into mosques. Many of the Greeks were Muslim by day and Christian by night. So when we're talking about citizenship and what's being withheld, I could talk to you for hours on this subject. And people were murdered in the street because they were non-citizens. As a matter of fact, we had underground schools to teach the youth um, uh, the Greek language so that we could retain it. We had lay preachers because we had no theological schools at the time, and we had lay preachers so that we could main maintain our Christian faith. So citizenship is extremely, extremely important. And when we fought the revolution in 1821 and gained our independence from the Turks, Europe was scared to death because of the French Revolution and the chaos and the murders that occurred afterwards. And they did not want that to occur in Greece. So the rulers of the time, the monarchs, got together and they took a German prince, picked him up and plopped him in Greece and he became the head of state. And the Greeks have all of a sudden became subject to um, uh, 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 a German monarch, but he became the king of Greece. And that stayed that way until a vote in the 1970s that eliminated the monarchy and Greece became a republic. Um, well, I cannot speak for America. However, in my perspective, I think that why Nepal has a citizenship by blood is because um, we've recently overthrown our monarchy, meaning like we were under monarch for a very long time. And at the time, um, um, India was being conquered by the British. So if you like open your borders to like citizenship by birth, a lot of people could like come and go in very easily. And I think that's pretty much the reason why in our country we have citizenship by blood. However, this is just my personal perspective. I cannot speak for the entire Nepalese community. I'm pretty sure they would have different opinions. But when I think about it, I think that's the reason. The time has come to bring today's discussion to a close. I would again like to remind students that tonight's event was a Windows to the World sanctioned event. If you'd like to earn Windows to the World credit, please swipe your card with one of our Windows to the World representatives at the back of the room. I would like to thank the members of our panel for volunteering their time and expertise for this event. I would also like to thank all of the people who worked to make this event a reality, including the members of the Panorama Planning Committee and the Informational Technology Department and the faculty, staff, and administrators who have supported Panorama in various ways. Most importantly, we would like to thank you all for being a part of the discussion.